we're going to start out talking about how to extend the season and some simple ways, maybe things you can do now, things you can't do now. Um, and he'll kind of go through, through some ideas and then we'll have a general Q&A and love to hear about what's going on in your garden, you know, questions about cover crops or what you're going to do for the winter. So uh, I guess I'll start out with a question, you know, I, I, my garden's kind of closed up, you know, not closed up, but um, I don't really have anything uh, prepared to extend the season besides I have some hoops and row cover that was covering my kale. So is that something I could use um, going forward or is it not enough just to have the row cover on hoops? Gotcha. Hey everybody, um, I, I don't know, well Joseph, Joe I know, but um, Kant and is it Greet? Gret? Uh, it, my daughter's name is Greta, I'm Abigail. Oh, Abigail. Yeah, Abigail. Uh, hi Abigail. Hello. Hi. So good to see you all. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get get started. Um, if anybody has any questions, please just ask away. Um, and uh, as we're as we're speaking, but uh, no no set agenda. Um, but Ellen, for your question, um, the so a, a row cover is is made of a, a cloth, and there's not a lot of what, what they're great for is extending on either side of the season. Also, it, they're great for getting a few weeks in the early spring head start and for getting a couple weeks in the, in the autumn winter extension. Um, they, they help to insulate. So like when on a sunny day, they'll keep that sunshine radiation, kind of that heat from the daytime um, held with in and around the plants. Um, so now that the day length is getting shorter and there's more more nighttime in the cold, it you know there the row cover itself um, is going to start to lose its capacity to really extend the season and to encourage things to 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 grow. Um, so it's a, it's a great extension and and um, maintainer of like summer heat, summer energy, but it's not gonna be like the best place to germinate or to create a conditions for, for growth, for new growth. Does that make, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so the row cover, the cloth or reme, if anybody, if everybody's familiar with that, is it, it are folks familiar with that cloth? And no, reme? what's it made of? I mean, it, it feels like, um, it feels like a, like very thin, Cot. I don't. I. It, I'm not quite sure what it's actually made of. Ellen, do you know? It's like it's it's a well, it's a polyester. it's a polyester product, but it's kind of like a really thin linen kind of, mm, you linen. know, like a, a fine cotton product. Um, I'll 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 put some info in the notes so you know. Um, and so you can build like a little frame with some wire, you know, a little hoop house, and then run the reme over it. So it creates a little little hoop house over over your beds if you if if it's used that way could i cover it with something else to to extend it even more yeah if, if you have greenhouse plastic so reme plus greenhouse plastic is is very good it, it that help that's like a double insulation and the the plastic actually helps to um like create some more passive solar heating um what another idea that that works too is placing stones throughout the the bed so underneath like in the bed in between plants underneath the reme underneath the plastic mm -hmm. is placing stones so that will heat up in the sun um, during the day and then at night radiate that heat um, if that makes sense so that that's so oh. stones that have I don't know maybe more quartz in it um, granite, things that will um, hold, like generate, not generate heat, but like capture the heat and then hold it and then slowly give it off at the nighttime is, is will, will help. Um, will the local, do the local stones meet that need or would you have to find them elsewhere? 
yeah i would try i i think like the darker stones um like with some quartz in it and a darker stone might be really good um just dark dark colors tend to hold the heat um and then radiate that heat so sometimes uh, i've seen and heard from people they'll also in their greenhouses that are passive heating they'll you know you can use stones but on a big house it's it's hard to find large enough stones but some people will have barrels of water that they'll they'll paint the the barrels a dark color and then fill it with water and so the the barrel heats up during the day the water water which has a very high holding capacity for heat um and it will heat up during the day and then at night it will give off that heat and it will be held within the house within the greenhouse so you could mimic something like that in a little little hoop cover um around your garden beds if you now, fill up I'm oh, sorry, if you use plastic though, you, do you have to worry about scorching the, the plants? Not at, I don't think at this time of year, um, <laughs> because the, the sun is at an angle. Um, so it's coming in at a different angle to the plants. It's not right overhead. It's not going to hit the plants on their surface. It's going to kind of hit them at an angle on their surface. So there's, there's less um, potential for, for like scolding um, from sun at this time of year. Mm. So um, in, in that type of situation, Doug, um, if we set that, if I set that up, is there any plants that I could start now in that situation? Yeah, you could try um, the, you know, the, the winter time is, at least in the Northeast, you can't really grow much more than leafing crops. And that, that is so because the leaf stage of plants are the like the first stage of a plant's growth. They don't need a lot of energy in order to create those leaves. Um, whereas fruiting plants, so like the reason why we can't grow, one of the reasons why we can't grow fruit like tomatoes and peppers and eggplant through the winter is that there is not enough sun time, sunlight energy for those plants to gather up and hold and, and, and create, go through their entire life process to make that seed, that fruit. There's just not enough sun, sunlight. Mm -hmm. So, but leafing crops, there is enough sunlight um, hours to make a leaf. So spinach, arugula, lettuce greens, things that don't need a lot of energy, a lot of sunlight energy time, um, you, can, you can grow. And maybe, you know, planting uh, like a circle around a stone um, you know, a stone that is going to be heating up during the day mm -hmm. and then radiating that heat and, you know, planting like a, a ring of lettuce or spinach or something around those stones so that there's extra heat um, going through the nighttime. I have a little bag of oh, sorry. lettuce. <laughs> See, sorry. We'll, we'll get to you in a sec. Go ahead. It's okay, oh. Dorothy. Okay. Uh, I have a little bed of lettuce that's been serving me all summer, and it's just the size of a little plastic box. Do you think I could put a plastic box over it? One of those yeah. translucent plastic boxes? Yeah. Yeah, maybe poke a, a couple little holes um, just so that air can move mm -hmm. um, on the sides, and then mm -hmm. just making sure to give it water because it won't get rain if it's in a plastic yeah. box. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Sue, did you have a question? Uh, yes. If, if we uh, put things under, you know, these coverings, would we still need to put hay or something to cover the, the, gra the ground so that there's not bare soil between the plants? I, I would. Just, just because the, the sun will still find the bare soil. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, just keeping the soil covered at all times is... Is, is a is a good practice and it, it'll help to hold heat in the soil too because if soil is bare that cold um, air will will touch the soil and and the soil will especially the top will will cool down much quicker without um, some covering on it so having a, a, a light mulch even just some hay or leaves or something on the soil will keep it from um, getting too cold okay thank you 
So some other ideas are um, building a cold frame. So we, we, we just briefly talked about the plastic row cover, which is a, you know, a pretty easy thing to set up. Um, another thought is uh, a cold frame, which there's different designs for them. Um, I love the picture that Ellen had put in the email um, for the call tonight. Uh, which was just a, a few hay bales kind of built in a rectangle, put up in a rectangle, and then a, a, a glass door um, frame on, on top of those hay bales. So, and then plants growing in the space in between the hay bales. Um, and that, that's, for many reasons, that, that is a beautiful, um, very efficient way of, um, so it, the hay bales protect from wind um, whatever's growing in between, they have a high insulation capacity. So they're going to keep whatever's inside warm. Um, so it's blocking wind, it's keeping warm warmth in. Um, and then the glass on top is a, like a solar generator. Um, so it's going to heat up whatever, you know, create, create a warm atmosphere in that little capsule in, in the middle. Um, and then you know, at nighttime, that heat will radiate, but it will be held by the hay bales um, much more efficiently than if there weren't, wasn't a siding. Um, so other people I've seen cold frames built dug into the ground. So you can dig down, cultivate a bed under, you know, under the, the level of the ground, and then have some kind of glass or plastic um, covering on top. And that will create a little environment um, down below ground level. So it's going to be insulated by the ground. Um, How deep do you have to go? Uh, I mean, like, I mean, you don't want to go five feet down, like five feet, three feet is where like the, the temperature of the ground stays moderated throughout the season. So it will stay around 50 degrees, like five feet down. But like at that point, there's going to be too much of a shadow um to to grow anything um the sun's not going to be able to hit those plants so you can go down a few inches even to a foot probably um you want to be conscious of the angle of the sun in the winter time that it's going to get continue to get lower so if the sun is angling at a certain degree and and the ground it's going to cause a shadow in, in most of it. So, um, and then the plants won't get any light. Um, so you don't want to be too deep, um, but deep enough to have some insulation. Yep. Seven, six, um, six, six, with the hay bales, will the animals get into that? Mm. Into the, into the hay? Yeah. Uh, they, they might, um, like, like mice or, um, Wait. What's that? Yeah. Well, not necessarily nesting in the hay, but get in so that they could eat what you're growing. Oh. Uh, they they might, but I mean, it would be. It, it I I feel like it would be difficult for, for I think yeah I mean you you're getting at like a protection kind of idea that the hay bales might also serve as protection from, from critters during the winter time. Um, hay bales are like two two feet thick, so they're they would be difficult for larger animals to get through um, and to get under because they're wide. So you'd have to dig a tunnel. But hopefully, if you were planting in something like that, you'd be going out every now and then and, and actually being able to see if there was a, a tunnel being wow. built. Wow! 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 What's that? Whoops. So um, do, would you need to have some kind of a venting um, system for a, a door on top of hail, a hay? I, I don't, I don't know. I don't feel like, I, I feel like there'll be enough cracks between the, the glass and the hay for mm -hmm. air to move. Um, also air will move somewhat through a hay bale. Um, I think through, at least through the tops where the where the door, where the glass will be meeting the hay. There's not, it's not gonna, unless you make it seal tight, which which is difficult to do on a hay bale. 
um, there'll be spaces for, for air to move. Um, but just making sure, checking, you know, checking the glass, checking the plastic for condensation. Um, you know, condensation will imply that there's not really great air movement and too much not great air movement will lead to some, you know, possible um, molding or other fungal things. Um, so air is important to have. Is there a lot of watering involved in a cold frame or does it stay pretty mediated? Uh, it depends on the sunlight. So the, the temperature is going to be lower throughout the winter. So there's not going to be as much evaporation due to heat um, in the wintertime um, than there is in the summer. And also the amount of sunshine is going to be less. So it won't be as much watering as like in you know summer season but definitely making sure that you know a couple of times to a few times a week um, there's a little bit of water um, but you also want to make sure that you're not watering too much because there isn't going to be that evaporation that's happening so plants will you know get and hold on to water um, longer so making sure that you're not over watering um, is that Lori on the call I, I don't I don't know on the phone who just uh, answered the asked the question about the animals and the hay i don't have a i don't have a great answer for that um so if anybody else does uh but i, I i'm not sure attention homeowners we need high visibility homes a lot of safety that's me so sorry you have to mute me can we use your home <laughs> Exactly. Can, can you mute, mute yourself, Helen? There he is. Oh, yeah. You know what? I was trying to find this. There's a woman on, um, not that you, she made this really easy cold frame. Um, it's called, she has, she's from Arkansas. It's called Roots and Refuge Farm. Okay. It's really cool, like YouTube things. And she made this cold frame, like it was like for $20. It was, um, very rudimentary. So that's what I was trying to bring up, but I got that ad instead. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'll, I'll check it out and I'll share it, Helen. Okay. Yeah. She takes a, a um, she virtually like two things. So she takes a bag of soil and, and cuts, um, just leaves a little bit of the plastic around the edge. And because it fits right in one of those plastic bins that we kind of use to put things in and then store them in the attic. Yeah, she's she um and, and the you buy a um a bag of soil that fits right in there. <laughs> so she puts the bag of she put the bag of soil down, and she cut with you know a knife. She cut around, took off the top plastic of the bag, planted her seeds, you know, took the cover off of the storage bin and inverted it. Oh. And I saw that. I thought that was very interesting. Right. Yeah. She poked, she poked holes, I think, in the bag to make sure oh, it for wouldn't drainage. get too soggy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think so. And probably, if, if Doug is right, poked holes in the plastic box over it. To right. Keep air circulating. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think that was like, you know. But I kind of lost interest when I noticed that she lived in Arkansas. I know. <laughs> <laughs> not not politically, but, but <laughs> temperature wise. Right, temperature wise, yeah. Season wise. Yeah, know. I'm probably one of the only New Yorkers who's ever actually been to Arkansas. I have. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. <laughs> Love Arkansas. <laughs> but again, there there's yeah. People are incredibly creative. Um, I don't know if anybody's been on. Uh, it's called I think Pinterest. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> which has just like people put their pictures of, of fun things that they do um and any it, it's a great space to just like get ideas um it's an Wait, online Doug, you go on pinterest i i have <laughs> never done that james I, <laughs> oh yeah my, well, my, well my, thing my... i one thing i learned on youtube was to prune your zucchini to take off some of the leaves to allow the pollinators to reach the blossoms and pollinate them. Ah. Hmm. 
because I was getting a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of blossoms and then sort of rot. Oh. And the the YouTube explained that if that happens, if the tip starts to rot, it's because it wasn't fertilized. Hmm. So oh. I never knew that. The YouTube. But I got, uh, I planted a butternut squash and I have to show you what I got. This is this is a mini one that I got. Um, Cute. And I've never seen anything like that. It, I never saw a butternut squash to look like that. It can you, can you hold it back, neck, right? back a little bit? Yeah, hold it back a little, yeah. This is that, a mini that, one. That's the this shape that they're one. supposed to be, I've heard, though. Oh, I really? like some of those, yeah. Like when, it is when, a butternut? When a really narrow neck like they're they're not necessarily supposed to be like that they're they're supposed <laughs> to be more like that like yours i think so that's great yeah really i'm used to the long neck and yeah. the color is a little bit lighter now this one i harvested early because i wanted to get it before the chipmunks eat it mm -hmm. but uh <laughs> the chipmunks were eating the seeds of my Rose of Sharon. Oh. And I think I may have distracted the chipmunks from my tomatoes by having a, a bundle of that a very cheap um, deer, deer repellent netting, plastic mesh that's practically in invisible, but I had a little bit left over, so I scrunched it and I put it around the tomatoes and I think it may have scared the chipmunks away because they were eating my tomatoes big time. Yeah, I had that problem this year. Yeah. I had one zucchini plant and I was so excited when it had a bud of the flower and then some animal ate the flower. Does anyone know what animals like to eat the flower and what you can do to help protect <laughs> the zucchini plants? Woodchucks, woodchucks will do that. Uh, was it your Italian neighbor? <laughs> oh, I, I have to say, I love zucchini flowers. Uh, they're delicious, um, but no. <laughs> well, this guy also said that zucchinis have two two blossoms, male and female. Yeah. Each each yeah. plant. I you know, what did I know? Gosh, no more now. Yep. yep. <laughs> so, Doug, any more uh, ideas for us? Um. Pinterest. <laughs> no. Um, I don't, does anybody have any more questions? I think it's like, it's, it depends on, on, I mean, it, it depends on what your garden looks like and, and like how you're growing. If you're growing in rows, it's, it's, it's very easy to build like a little hoop. Um, you know, I, I've made hoops. So for like a hoop house um, with, if you can picture a, like a bed, um, like a rectangular long bed, you put um, you can put rebar on either side, like a two foot piece of rebar, nail it, nail it down into the ground about a foot. So there's a foot in the ground, a foot above. And then you take a PVC pipe um, about a quarter inch thick and three feet wide. You put one end uh, three feet long, um, put one end in the rebar on one side and then you bend it over to the other one. So it creates a hoop. Oh, can can you picture that? Yeah, yeah. And then and then you do that every five feet. Oh, and then so you create the 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 bones of a hoop house, um, and then you just you put over that um, either greenhouse plastic or uh, reme, um, and you have yourself you you've just made like a little hoop house. Um, reme, what's that? Reme is the is the cloth linen like covering that we were speaking about before. It's it's called reme, um, mm -hmm. or there's other names for it, but it's a cloth covering. How do you spell you that? You know how that's spelled, reme? Uh, R-E-M-A-Y, I believe. Oh. Um, and I think Mill River might might carry it. Ag we do. West probably does. Oh, Lee. <laughs> I'm here. We do. We have it. <laughs> Lee of Mill River. Um, you do have it. OK, great. So yeah. if you need reme, um, Mill River Supply, Adams Street, Bedford Hills. Or Was you could use the plastic. Yeah, it's Lee. Lee or you could use the plastic, right, for the winter instead. Yeah. 
do y'all carry greenhouse plastic too, Lee? Um, I have like a, a heavy duty mill plastic. I don't know if it's necessarily greenhouse, but it's a clean, a clear heavy duty plastic that you probably could use. Yeah. Yeah. Are you from Mill River Supply? I am. Wonderful. I see your glasses. <laughs> yeah, I didn't you recognize you. Yeah, you probably <laughs> met Dorothy. Um, yes. Lee, Lee comes to the meetings. There you go. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> So, Doug, how much sunlight do you, does your um, cold frame need to get? Because the sun, you know, the winter, it's not much light anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, most plants, I, I think, like six, five to six hours of sunlight. Um, even maybe even less, four to six for 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 leaf for leafy leafy crops. Um, and on the smaller side of that, like it you know, growing collards, kale, like some of the larger brassicas is like need a little bit more energy than say lettuce or spinach um, mm -hmm. or arugula, some of those like smaller cutting greens. Um, if you're able to start plants indoors and then move them out underneath a covering, that's going to get a, like a, a bigger head start than trying to start seeds um, outside at this time it's it's you can still do it at you know i would think by november it might be getting a little bit late but you know you could you could plant seeds um you know try planting seeds up through the first or second week of november and depending on the weather um mm -hmm. you know it is warmer these days so yeah um, you might have some germination hmm. but if you're able to start plants inside um, and then move them out, you might have a better chance. You mean, and get a crop before winter? Through, no. winter. Through, winter. Through, winter. Through winter. Through the winter. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. you can start, you can start crops now if there's, if you have a good sunny spot. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also like that, what we've been talking about is also like, if you have a buy-in, if you're growing biennial, say brassicas, like kale, or collards, which are which are biennials, so they they naturally want to live through a winter, so they can make seed the next season. If you can cover them and protect them, um, they will continue to live uh, through the winter, um, uh -huh. most definitely. Um, oh. Kale and collards and Swiss chard will die if it if it's like really like cold frost, but kale and collards will live through hard frost, especially if they're, if they're um, protected in some way. Hmm. Does it matter which kale? I mean, any kale would do it? Any kale would grow? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think red Russian is a little more sensitive than say like, a, like red Russian types are more sensitive than uh, Toscano or Lacinato or dinosaur kale. Oh, okay. uh, winter boar kale though will, will live straight through winter. Curly kale. Winter uh, whirl, whirl, okay. Winter boar, that's one variety. It's called, okay. it's more like the smaller leaf, like cr really tight, crinkly. Um, that those are, those are very hardy. Um, so yeah, so extending the season for those crops um, is mm -hmm. another way to use some of the things that we've been talking about. Great, thanks. Yeah. Someone's raising their hand. <laughs> Hi. So when you were talking, I think Helen about the lady who puts the bags on the ground mm -hmm. and makes her little mini greenhouse um, or cold frame. So I have a section of lawn that I want to turn into a full new bed for the spring. And I was and I thought maybe this was like a really good what what do you think about if i put various you know bags of soil and did the whole cold frame surrounded by hay bales like would that effectively kind of smother the the ground and and then just let everything the hay bale rot and and the i guess the bag would smother the grass underneath and then in the spring i can just rake the hay, hay bales on for mulch and keep going or like what do you think that that would be a, a, an effective starter or do I need to do more? Well, 
the the plastic will just be hard for roots to get through um but i mean maybe you could do like newspaper or cardboard like mm -hmm. um wet it and then and then put soil on like pour the soil if you're if you're trying to start a garden pour the soil onto that um mm -hmm. and then put the plants in in that and by the time the the cardboard will do the same thing as plastic would by blocking sunlight from the grass so it'll kill the grass mm -hmm. um, but then as it decomposes the roots of the plants that you plant into that soil on top will will be able to get through um hmm. yeah does that does that i mean if, yeah, if you're thinking I, to start a garden right is it is, is that yeah that? and i was just trying to think how to get started on it this fall yeah and then maybe double as a cold frame <laughs> yeah totally i think that's a beautiful I, that will look gorgeous if, if you do that please take pictures all right <laughs> have an outline of of hay bales and then in the middle just fill the middle where there's grass with cardboard or, or newspaper um mm -hmm. ellen and i did a video last month so if if you need like a visual of that you can see i what watched it you did. Oh, okay <laughs> yeah. so okay, that goes yeah. down and then you put you wet it so that the cardboard starts to decompose and then you put soil on top of that um cool. topsoil and then a little compost and can. then the, the other little question is, I have all of this like really slimy compost that was in a tumbler and I just, I can't seem, it, I'm adding all sorts of browns and stuff and it's just, mm. if, if I take that out and just lay it out on the ground in a future garden spot and cover it with some hay, am I doing damage or is it going to take care of itself over the long haul? Uh, it, I, I mean, nature will balance things out. Um, yeah. so if it, if it is kind of ex exposed and allowed to interact with the natural, the, the you know, the, the native grasses and the, the soil and stuff, you know, all of the microorganisms will eventually start to repopulate that substance. <laughs> Um, and re in it. Um, right now, it, if it's gooey and, and yuck, you know, icky like that, it's, it's going to be anaerobic. There's not a lot of air in there. And so it's going to be populated by anaerobic thriving um, organisms, which are not bad necessarily, but they habitate an environment that is not the most conducive to plant growth. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, if you spread that out over a space, it's not going to hurt the space it'll just um take time for it to like recompose into a aerobic soil if that makes sense so if i use that maybe around or under the hay bales to kind of give something to be able to use it mm -hmm. and but yeah, not yeah. Have the soil mixed with it in any way yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't mix it with the 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 planting soil necessarily mm -hmm. i mean you could put it around the edges um so that like there i mean there is life in there that will help to inoculate um you know even even though they're m mostly anaerobic microorganisms they you know there's still life in there and so it'll balance out but like not putting it not mixing it with your garden soil necessarily yeah. and then grow, growing in it but putting it on the periphery yeah I think that's a good idea maybe she could mix it with some leaves on the outside there yeah. yeah or yeah, like i i all we have these huge oak leaves and they get they also get very like anaerobic -y, slimy because they pile mm. up and i don't have any way of chopping them up so i'm a little can i mean I, i'll rake them on the to beds that are kind of there but um i don't know if anyone had any brilliant ideas about what to do with huge leaves that you can't chop well, I did get, I got a leaf chopper for myself because I have several huge oak trees and I, I'm trying to not leave, you know, to leave the leaves, but too many leaves on the lawn will kill the lawn, I understand. But I also made myself, got a little bin, uh, which is really made of chicken wire, sort of. And I bought that and I put a lot of leaves in that. And by, by next summer, it's mostly 
a healthy mush. Right. <laughs> you could, Except uh, I learned from Doug that healthy mush <laughs> needs rocks and, <laughs> and minerals and all that. <laughs> Can you mow the leaves? I, well, I, I do we, mow the leaves a little bit in the beginning, but after the next storm, there's going to be so many leaves, they're going to kill the lawn, I think. Hmm. How about, that, that's uh, one way to chop them up. Yeah. I, I, um, we live on like, I live on a private school. So they, the lawn is maintained by the people who maintain the property. So I'm sort of like gradually infringing on their area <laughs> with gardens. Um, but I don't uh, have a mower. Abigail, are you, did, did we email? I do live in Paul. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank Where you. do you live? Pauling, New York. Pauling, all right. Yeah. So I'm just trying to slowly, without making anyone too upset, take up the lawn. <laughs> how big how well, big how big an area your gar is your garden gonna be? Um I, I'm not sure. It it sort of depends on how how ambitious I get with the with the whole cold frame hay bale experiment. Yeah. Mm. But right now I only have like a a 10 by 30 that's, spot. That's good size. It's it's awesome, but I want, you know, more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on pollinating. I'm trying to get rid of my Pachysandra and replace it with pollinating plants. And I'm trying to persuade, I mean, we've got done some really good work in Pleasantville, uh, taking up empty plots, digging them up and putting in pollinating plants and really making beautiful gardens there. So it's a whole new way of thinking about gardening. I mean, the blossoms are not as beautiful, but you're helping the pollinators. I think about like native species. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's nice. And and this aster, this wood aster, I think that I used to rip up yeah. religi <laughs> very re religiously. Uh, it's, it's white, little white blossoms and it blooms in the fall. But now you can buy it at Rosedale Nurseries because oh. it is a pollinating plant. <laughs> wow. They're almost like a purple white, right? Are they no, kind of... This is white, white. I bought a purple one that I love and I have to put a, in, in a good spot. But, uh, but this is white, just white. And it's kind of wispy and flimsy looking, but um, it is a pollinator. There are many different types of asters. I mean, easily 20 or more. Wow. Uh -huh. Hi, Mary. Hi. We were emailing before too. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know, somehow I never got the Zoom link, but anyway, I'm here. Thank you. You're oh, welcome. Thanks Thank for coming. Thank you. Great. Any other, how any other general questions? Are people planting cover crop? Are you covering your soil? You know, what yeah, are you using? I, yeah. I planted pea and oats and vetch, and it's huge. It's, it's like, you know, I put it in maybe a, maybe a wee bit too early or just the Indian summer is, is being really good to it, but it's really, it's quite tall and already starting to flower. So I'm gonna have to wow. give yeah. it a haircut mm. unless you... I want to see it next, you know, in the spring, which I don't. And it also kind of, you know, I planted uh, radish and turnips and, uh, carrots and it kind of overwhelmed and I think just shaded them out of existence so I got like two turnips coming up so anyway I'm clearing certain areas I'm going to put turnips in still and hmm. carrot hey yeah. Doug a, lot, a bunch of people have um, emailed me asking about like how to figure out planting cover crops and when to mulch if to mulch um, maybe you could talk to that a little bit like they have maybe the cover crops are short and they're not sure if they should mulch now or mulch around it or, um, you know, hmm. what do you think? Mul mulching and cover cropping? Yeah, like if you're cover cropping and it's maybe it's not thick, that thick. Oh. 
or um, it's not going to grow that tall? Do you kind of wait now until the oat, the oat mix, the like the winter kill? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's something really like special that happens when the oats grow and they die. Even when they die, they they their 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 bodies and their roots still hold like hold the soil like i don't know if anybody's really like observed this with an oat pea cover crop but like when they do die after the frost like and the and the soil looks somewhat like there's patchiness like within the soil between like the where the the oats act, where they fall there's something still alive there it, it doesn't feel like just bare soil um so that like having the root, the, the oats and the seeds planted there and, and like they're, as they're growing, their roots are growing deeper. And so through the winter, when they die, they're slowly recomposing into soil. So there's like activity happening. It, it's not just bare soil. Um, but I understand what you're saying. If, the, if they're not big enough, if they're not that tall and they're, when they die, they're not gonna leave that much, much residue on the right. soil. Mm -hmm. residual matter um i i would wait till they die um to start or i don't know just like like if it's really patchy you can fill in the patches with with handfuls of um leaves or or hay or something some kind of mulch in the patchiness but um i i wouldn't necessarily try and cover the oats with anything if they're growing still okay in the video i don't know so what i was trying to convey was like i i plant the seeds often i'll, I'll plant cover crop seeds i'll work them in and then i will spread a light mulch over them of hay over the seeds um partially to insulate them if it's going to be cold which it, it will protect them it will um give them some more shelter so that they can germinate and when they do germinate they'll just germinate right through the hay um, and it also protects them from from birds so if you're not able to incorporate the seeds um into the soil by mixing them or um other ways uh putting a little mulch on top of them will keep them off of the out of like direct eyesight of of birds so it'll you know pr you know keep them from getting eaten yeah um, birds went after mine like crazy i you know i i planted and i i really just broadcast very loosely hmm. and um had done my rows of parsnips and and carrots deep deeper <laughs> and that's how i think i lost all the seed because i came back and there was all this scraping you know yeah scraping mm. over where i just put all my it was really not well thought out on my part so live and learn but yeah they at first i thought it was squirrels and chipmunks because we've just had such a huge uh, population especially of chipmunks this year it seems but um they dig holes you know mm. they dig deeper this was just scratching and in fact i snuck up on my plot and saw the little birds scraping away and you know <laughs> <laughs> they can have we them. learn every year we learn <laughs> so um looking forward let's say um when do you think we could be planting more cover crop in the spring maybe we didn't get to it this fall mm -hmm. um how soon can we do anything in the spring to get you know, um, something into the soil before we need to start the garden? I'd say like mid-March usually. Um, so when folks grow, say like a spring grain, um, if it's spring wheat or spring barley or some kind of cereal grain, um, planting in the early spring. So it's like when the soil um, is, you know, cultivatable, it's not frozen anymore after the thaw um yeah you're pretty much gauging it by by soil temperature and the thaw so it's gonna be like later march that you can get oats and peas in the ground um 
So, you know, when people plant, if you, if you plant, if you like engage uh, St. Patrick's Day um, for planting peas, uh, it's kind of the same, same idea that like, you know, St. Patrick's Day is usually around the same time that the ground is thawed and warm enough to plant peas, which can tolerate that cold soil and that cold weather. Um, you can you can plant around that same time, um, depending on the on the seed on what the weather's like. Um, a cover crop of oats and and peas, and also spring um, spring wheat, spring barley, like other other cereal grains that can act as a cover crop. Um, you can also plant those in the in the spring at that same How time. How long do they have to grow to actually do something for the soil? Like if you had it for a few weeks and then had to put another plant another plant in, would that be enough? Or do you have to wait till they flower? No, I mean, as soon as the plants start growing and start photosynthesizing, they're doing, they're doing activity in the soil. They're supporting, you know, as soon as a plant starts to photosynthesize, it's gonna start putting sugar into the soil mm. and feeding the, the microbiology in the soil. Um, so yeah, you'll, it'll be much better than having the soil be bare at that point. Um, yeah. When you spread the cover crop seed, it's a very basic question. How often do you need to water it? In, in, in the spring, you don't really, you don't have to water it. There's enough soil, usually enough water in the soil at that time of year already from, from the thaw and from the, the freeze and thaw and the, and the snow melting. There's enough water um, in there, in the soil at that time that you don't really have to water a lot. Yeah. And in the fall? In the fall, I, 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 I never have watered cover crop seed. Um, it, it's usually, it's the same kind of thing at this time of year too. Mm. The, the, um, the moisture that's held through the night, I don't know if people have, if you've noticed, like there's a lot of dew in, in the mornings now at the colder temperatures coming and the, the warmer days and the cooler temperatures and that creates a lot of um, condensation or not condensation, uh, perspiration, um, respiration, like in the night. So th that amount, that water that is created through plants respiring and the cooler nights holding that, that water t closer to the earth, um, oh. there's enough water there for seeds to germinate. Um, so I've never had to, I've never had to water cover crops. Um, but you, if it's especially dry, um, and there's a rain coming, putting this plant, you know, sowing the cover crop, planting up, broadcasting the cover crops before a rain um, is, is good so you don't have to water. And also another idea is pre-soaking cover crop seeds in um, for like overnight. So if you're going to plant tomorrow, putting what you would be planting, what seeds you would be planting in, in a container, covering them with water, um, so it's like a pre-soaking. So it, it, it starts the, the germination process of the seed. So once you broadcast them the next day, um, they've already had um, kind of that initial uh, water um, engagement so that they'll, they'll germinate quicker. This year was pretty dry and I, I don't usually water the cover crop, but I did this year. And um, I, I found that it really pushed it. Mm -hmm. Water too. Doug, I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Um, I make my own almond milk and I get my almonds from a place in California that doesn't spray. Mm -hmm. It's called Wild Soil and they do kind of um, regenerative farming and they seem to be a really good source. Now I'm always left with the residual, uh, the grounds. You know, and you can only dry so much and use it for almond flour until you're like up to your up to your ears in it. So I'm I want to put it in the ground. <laughs> Does mm -hmm. that make sense? It's you know it's the it's the pulp. I've squeezed it in a in a milk bag. You know I've squeezed all the liquid out, and then I tend to dry it out and and make almond flour out of it. But I just have so much I don't need anymore. I do add two dates and a little bit of vanilla. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, 
do you think that'll draw animals? It sounds delicious. I, it, <laughs> it's good. It's really good. <laughs> I'll make Probably. you some. <laughs> like you just make like you some. <laughs> make that into little balls and yeah. Well, you know, there like there are all kinds of things you can you can do with it, but yeah, I don't do all that. You know, it's like I just tend not to do that. I've got a big bag of it, you know, in the fridge, and it's like I'm composting it when I don't use it, um, you know, for home or something, but. I've started my own, um, I'm actually making my own compost against the co-op rules, but they don't know anything about, you know, I'm being very stealthy and, you know, I want to kind of, I just want to think about maybe can I use it in my soil or in my compost? What do you think? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Put it in your compost. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't think there's anything in there that doesn't sound, sound good. To, to compost um you could sprinkle it on the soil you could sprinkle it around the plants um okay. you know kind of crumble it uh yeah. um gently work it into the soil around around the, the plant bases um but yeah mixing that into the compost would be fine i think okay you said it was just it was almonds dates and and vanilla extract yeah 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 Sounds i was yeah. using I was yeah. using coconut, but I stopped doing that. And that I thought might draw rodents or, you know, just the sweetness of it. I don't know. Or ants. Yeah. Ants, <laughs> maybe, yeah. yeah. Put that into a food dehydrator. You have a nice snack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little dry, really? but yeah. Yeah, yeah no, no. Compost are right on top of the soil around the plant should be fine. Great. Yeah. Thank you. you okay. talk we all, I just want to tell you, we only have like five minutes. Doug has to go right at eight o'clock. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. I don't want to be too abrupt. Um, so, uh, if, and if there's questions following up, you can email Ellen and I. Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Anytime. Doug, mentioned, <laughs> Doug mentioned so soaking seeds. I think I overdo it. If you overdo it too long, then the seeds get too vulnerable. If you soak um, them, open, if you soak them three nights, <laughs> they they they'll start to sprout. At, I mean, if they're in water, they won't sprout. But if you soak them overnight and then you remove the water and you have them exposed to the air, they will start to sprout. If they've sprouted, um, if they've already sprouted and then you broadcast them, that's going to be tough on them. But if, if they, I mean, you can take actual individual seeds that have sprouted and place them in contact with the soil and they'll grow. But yeah. like, like not being as intentional and careful <clears throat> with them at that point, they have, a, they will very likely break the, 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 um, the growth. Mm -hmm. um, so you just want to be careful. It's like before they start to sprout, but as soon as they're about to emerge is, is like a good, you know. So 24 to 48 hours is, is the max. Yeah, and keeping them in water for longer than that is going to turn anaerobic. Like no, I just, there's I enough just, oxygen. Yeah. I just put them between paper towels, wet oh, paper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I have yeah, to Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to keep them in water for much longer than night um, just because there's enough oxygen in that water to create, you know, to hold oxygenation in an in, in aerobic environment relatively. Um, not aer aerobic environment, but enough oxygen in there to, to not start to spoil the seeds. More than that, the oxygen is going to respire and, you know, three, three days in water is going to be too much, I think. Um, but uh, any last questions? Yeah, Doug, I have a question about squash. Um, I planted it late in the season, probably around June, end of June, because uh -huh. I wanted to avoid the, the, the vine borer beetle. Uh -huh. uh, so the squash is going good, but uh, I know the weather weather's getting cooler. Is there any way I can cover them and keep them fruiting, or is it because now they're not a leafy vegetable that uh, the sun isn't going to much affect on no. them? No. I think at this point, Joe, like they're far enough along that you can keep them going um, with some protection and, and like a remay or plastic or something that you can get over them or at least around them. 
um, you can like pile up hay, right. make like a little barrier, a wall um, a around them so that at least that'll block the wind. Um, right. And like, but yeah, you can, they're, they're far enough along. They've already, are they flowering? Yeah, I've got fruit from them. But, fruit. Uh, oh, so yeah. they're already in that stage yeah. of, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I okay. think you should be, you should be good. And is it too late to plant um, a fall uh, crop, uh, like uh, cover crop, I'm sorry, or is it okay to wait till November or should I put, plant it now? Yeah, if you, if you can get it in so soonish, um, yeah. I mean, the, the weather, it's pretty warm. Um, so the soil is going to stay warm for a while. Um, at this point, I would say probably through like the mid, the first week of November, you might be able, not, not the oats, it's too late for oats. Yeah. Um, but the rye mix, um, you should get some germination if you plant in the next couple of weeks. Okay, thanks. Yeah. We have time for one quick answer. Yeah. I'm growing a, a butternut squash, like a honey nut, honey butternut, whatever. It's, it's a um, Dan Barber seed from his little seed company. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar I, with that. I have and that. and I've, I've got 29 beautiful squash, butternut type squash, and I've never grown them before. And so I'm reading different things like, do I wait until the whole vine dies before I, and then pull the vine up and keep them on the vine and season them for a couple of weeks? Or do I cut them? I'm reading, cut the stem, you know, a couple of inches, but make sure it's dry. I'm I'm kind of reading things that are confusing me more than than answering my, you know, my question, how to cultivate them. I found a beautiful video about squashes, all squashes, and how to season them, and so forth. If you want to email me, I can try to forward it to you. Uh, I'm you know, I'm D Greenberg at Pace. Okay, great, thank you. B E R G. B E R G, yeah. Okay. G Greenberg. And I love what do you the think video. about that, Doug? What do you it's think a, about that? I'm I'm wondering too. I have some squash hanging on vines. That are not quite mature yet. Well, some mature. Yeah. Oh. So they look mature to me. Yeah. Mine do. What, what kind of squash are they? Uh, I think Mary has honey nut. I have some butternut. Okay. So the uh, probably for both. Um the on the tops by the stem of butternut what will be green stripes. Um, and so the green stripe, as soon as those green stripes, this is what I've been told um, and, and what I've done in the past, as soon as those green stripes fade to orange um, mm -hmm. and there are no more green stripes on the stem, that's when it's mature and ready to cut. Um, so that's one indication. I've also gotten away with it being a little, some faded green stripes, you can still see them. Um, and, and then cutting it and curing it, uh, they, they've lasted through the winter for me. Um, acorn squash, uh, if the acorn squash is sitting on the ground, you'll know it's ready when they're, if you lift it up and the part that's been sitting on the ground is orange. So that's a point where you can cut it. Um, I usually, I'll just cut the squash from the vine and leave it right where it is um, for as long as I can for, for before like the frost comes, um, but for like two weeks, just out in the sun, out in the rain, out in the wind, like that, that's called curing. Um, so I field cure my squash, the squash. Um, and that like fluctuation, that sunlight, that wind, that rain, um, it just like really toughens up the squash and the squash being cut from the vine start to, you know, the sugar start to, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, consolidate. What's that? Consolidate. Yeah, Condense. something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and so, and so, if you if you cut a like a butternut squash from the vine and then you and and then you eat it right away, it's not going to be very sweet. It's gonna it's gonna have a lot of water in it still. Um, so the curing process not only toughens up the squash or the garlic or whatever it is that you're curing, so that it lasts through the winter but the curing process also gives the squash time to for the sugars and all of the minerals and all of the things that make squash so yummy and good for us to um 
you know, to, to, uh, do its magic to become, you know, that. So curing is sweet potatoes, potatoes, onions is a really important process for some of those root root crops for storage ability and also for nutritional purposes too. Hey Doug, what if the vines are dead, but the, um, the squash is just hanging there. Can you just cure it like that? Yeah, it's it, it cut it from the, cut it from the plant and just kind of like leave it if you can leave it out in, in your garden, um, check on it, make sure that it's not getting nibbled on by anybody. And if it is getting nibbled on, then you can bring it somewhere that's a little safer. But I, I've just found if the more exposure that the, that the, the fruits have um, in the curing process, more exposure to the, the cosmos, to the air, to the, to the sun, to the wind, to everything directly, the, the, the better that it will cure and the longer it will last through the winter. To bring okay. it in before the frost. Oh, sorry. Fascinating. Yeah, bringing it in before the frost or at least putting it somewhere where it's not gonna get touched by the frost. Um, I've left things in my, my car overnight in, in through freezing temperatures and even being within a car, um, the, the frost, the, the cold, cold air is not touching the, the fruit itself, if it was outside of the car, the frost would, but inside of the car, there's enough um, protection from that, from the frost cold um, touching it. So just at least getting it out before the frost into some protective area. Okay. Doug, do you think with the frost, if you just protect it, like kept it dry somehow? Like- Yeah, kept it dry. Um, like my brother, it, it frosted, it got close to freezing the other day or last weekend. My brother is growing um, his pumpkins where are like a few day we're a few days away from being ready to cut and cure. Um, but he he didn't want to cut them yet because they weren't mature. So he just over over the cold night, he before the night, he just piled on hay and and mulch like on top of the squash, the plant, the like the leaves, everything, the the fruit, and just kind of made like a little capsule over the the squash the plant um and then the next day just during the day took took it off so that was enough to keep it the plant alive through that really cold night um so at this time of year there's it's not there's not going to be multiple freezing days and nights which will kill the plants there mm -hmm. might be a freezing night um so at least protecting the plant through that freezing night should be enough would watering help? Um, I don't. I, I I don't think so. I mean, there's a there's a thought that like, if you if you water the plant and it freezes right away, the ice will protect the plant in 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 a in a way. The ice that forms on the plant will will actually create a shield. Um, but it's not it's not the intensity of the cold is not at that point this time of year. So I, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't know if watering um, would help. Okay, I think we're gonna, it's eight o'clock or a little after eight. So um, thanks for your extra time tonight, Doug. Of course. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank yeah. you so much. Thanks Reach everyone out. for coming. Yeah, we'll, thanks. We'll try to do something next month too. I have some ideas. If you have any ideas, email me. Love to hear what you wanna do. Sounds thank good. Thank you, Evan. Thanks, 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 Thank you, Alan. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Doug. Bye. Thanks, Alan. Bye. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye. Good night. Nice meeting you all. Same here.